Hey guys, I don't know say it's a girl Shensia here and I promised myself that after doing my first show that I would do a giveaway. So I bought over 100 tablets for kids who are in need. So if you are anybody that you know is in need of a tablet, please to let me know. I feel like, you know, with parents being underpaid right now because they have no choice and you know, some of you guys, they don't even have a job to much less purchase a tablet or a laptop for your kids to participate in online schooling it's extremely vital for kids to gain an access to be given a chance to get an education so yeah i bought them for you guys and i'll be distributing them island wide so hit me up or anybody from my team oh and one more thing i make sure to put my logo on it so if you see anybody trying to sell you this tablet please don't buy it but buy it full already now buy it from Nabadi. It's free. So the schools, please to hit me up as well because you know. Good afternoon, I'm Marjorie Gordon. And I'm Nika Lewis. In nationwide news at this hour, almost 48 hours after the first polls closed in the United States presidential election and a winner is yet to be announced. Democratic candidate Joe Biden has a slender lead in Nevada and Arizona and is chipping away at President Trump's advantage in Georgia and Pennsylvania. General voting ended a short while ago in the St. Vincent and Grenadines general elections, but persons quarantined as a result of COVID COVID-19 are being allowed to vote at this hour. Two prominent politicians in the PNP have come out in support of Mark Golding's candidacy while a former cabinet minister has announced support for Lisa Hanna with just two days to go before the presidential election. Director of Public Prosecutions DPP Paula Llewellyn says law enforcement must learn to pivot in the digital age. And High Commissioner of Canada to Jamaica says gender-based violence against women and children has increased in Jamaica. In news from the rest of the world, Kosovo president being held in detention in The Hague hours after resigning from office to face a war crimes indictment. And in sport, Waterhouse and Arche of Haiti lock horns for a quarter final spot in the Scotiabank CONCACAF Football League at the Stadium East Field this evening at 6. And later in our broadcast in our cover story at 5.35, the People's National Party presidential election is this Saturday, November 7. The candidates have signed a declaration of unity. But will this curtail the virtual comments and accusations from supporters of the two candidates? We'll talk politics in the cover story. In public opinion at 626, we ask your reaction to the Ministry of Education approving 17 schools to participate in the pilot phase of the resumption of face-to-face -face classes. Give us your comments by logging on to our Facebook page, Nationwide News Network, and by tweeting us at Nationwide Radio. 614, the nation's business farmer Rosemarie Samuels has has been awarded $65 million in damages as a Jamaica public service company was trespassing on her property. She'll join us in the nation's business as well as her attorney, Sean Kinghorn. At 7 o'clock, we go over to the St. Vince, to St. Vincent and Grenadines where Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez Gonzalves is going up for a record fifth term in office. Kosovo President Hashim Thachi is being held in detention in The Hague hours after resigning from office to face a war crimes indictment. The International Court said he and two other suspects were flown to the Dutch city today. Earlier this year, a special prosecutor accused Mr. Thachi and others of being criminally responsible for 100 murders during Kosovo's 1998 to 1999 independence war against Serbia. Mr. Thachi denies any wrongdoing. Mr. Thatcher said he was stepping down to ensure he would not face trial while serving as president. He said his resignation would defend the integrity of the state and he called on people to remain calm. His indictment had been expected since the special prosecution made accusations in June that the Kosovo leader was criminally responsible for nearly 100 murders, torture and enforced disappearances. The government of Jamaica says it's watching keenly developments in the United States, which it says could have implication for the local marijuana industry. Marijuana is legal in several states in the U.S., especially for medicinal purposes. But U.S. federal law, which governs multinational banks in the U.S., largely prohibits activities associated with marijuana cultivation. State Minister in the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce, Dr. Norman Dunn, says those laws negatively affect local medicinal marijuana businesses. 
we had a meeting with a major stakeholder in the industry and we have been having meetings with persons who are making various different proposals of how do we deal with this corresponding banking issue. It is a real issue. It is of real concern. In Tuesday's U.S. presidential election, several other states, including Arizona, New Jersey, South Dakota, Montana, and Mississippi, voted to legalize some form of marijuana use. Dr. Dunn notes candidates in the U.S. elections have also indicated their willingness to address the corresponding banking issues. We saw recently, and we are hoping, that as mentioned by one of the, the candidates and the team that is vying for presidency of the United States and vice presidency of the United States, that they have already given a commitment that a corresponding banking issue and how this is dealt with generally and the legalization and the movement of funds related especially to our industry that we're developing, which is the medical cannabis industry that we believe and hope that if that comes to fruition, then that is one aspect that we believe that will be sorted out in the near future. He says the government is continuing discussion on the issue at various levels. In the interim, we are continuing discussion at various different levels. We had a meeting last week which we invited many of the local banks to join in that virtual meeting on this particular issue. So the discussion is taking place at very, very high level because we believe that we need to solve this issue and we at the ministry is working as seriously at that to ensure that we have a solution that we can encourage this new industry to grow and develop and thrive. Dr. Norman Dunn, State Minister in the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce. Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP Paul Eluelin, says law enforcement must learn to pivot in the digital age. She was addressing the launch of the Digital Policing Criminal Investigation in the Technology Era training video yesterday. It is important, very important, that law enforcement is constantly reminded their skill set is enhanced to pivot and to change in the same way that the criminals, whether locally or foreign, as they engage in transnational crimes, are able to pivot. And we, as prosecutors and law enforcement, we have to keep more than one step ahead of them. She says prosecutors have to be able to use the laws at their disposal to compile all the evidence to secure a win in the courts. The prosecution comprises law enforcement and the prosecutors. It matters not to the court whether law enforcement fell down in their job or whether the prosecutor fell down in their job. We are the prosecution. Therefore, it is a win-win for us as well as the public when you have the investigators with their skill set being enhanced and their toolkit being enlarged. Paula Llewellyn, Director of Public Prosecutions. Meanwhile, Police Commissioner Anthony Anderson says the police have been relying heavily on the use of technology to help fight cyber crimes locally. He says science and technology have become the norm in solving crimes. It's really the combination of everything from video evidence to cyber evidence, from devices to ballistics to DNA, all combined with the traditional witness statements and all of that. But that, that science provides a bedrock and, and, and around which the investigation and later on the prosecution can hold on to, even as witnesses fade or no longer are interested or, you know, for whatever reason, that part now is there, still important, but that science provides the surety that we can continue cases even as, as things become more challenging, especially as the, the, the case progresses. Major General Anthony Anderson, Police Commissioner, both were speaking yesterday during a digital media launch. The final result of the U.S. presidential vote hinges on the states of Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. Updates are expected throughout the day, but it could be hours before a winner is announced. We hear more in this report from Marjorie Gordon. Democratic candidate Joe Biden has a slender lead in Nevada and Arizona.
and is chipping away at President Trump's advantage in Georgia and Pennsylvania. Biden, who is still on 253 electoral college votes, admits that a likely win for him will require much work to secure unity in the United States. I'm not naive. Neither of us are. I know how deep and hard the opposing views are in our country on so many things. But I also know this as well. To make progress, we have to stop treating our opponents as enemies. We are not, not enemies. What brings us together as Americans is so much stronger than anything that can tear us apart. The Trump campaign for the Republicans launched legal bids to stop the counts in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, and Michigan. President Trump has managed to secure 213 electoral college votes so far. He told supporters the party was getting ready to win the elections, but insists any shift is an act of fraud. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. So our goal now is to ensure the integrity for the good of this nation, this is a very big moment. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list. Okay? It's, it's a very sad, it's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment. Marjorie Gordon for Nationwide News. General voting has ended in the St. Vincent and the Grenadines general elections. But persons quarantined as a result of COVID-19 are being allowed to vote at this hour. Today's elections are expected to be a straight fight between Dr. Gonzalves' Unity Labour Party, ULP, and the new Democratic Party, NDP. The ULP is seeking its fifth consecutive term in office. Deputy Superintendent of Elections at the Electoral Office of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Sylvester King, spoke with our news center a short while ago. The polls close at 5 p.m. today and um, special arrangements were put in place for those persons who were in quarantine as a result of the COVID-19 and so an additional half an hour has been made has been put in place for those persons to vote so that they will not interface with the regular voters. So there were on our voters list 98,119 19 persons who were eligible to vote. There are 15 constituencies. And there are 15 constituencies. Mr. King says the preliminary results of the elections will be announced tonight. As has historically been the case, by sometime tonight, the winner would be the preliminary results. The preliminary results would indicate who have um, who, who is in the lead and who is a winner. And when you say sometime tonight, any more specific than that? I don't want, to, but I don't want to tie it down to any specific time. But I am almost certain before midnight. And the deputy supervisor of election says there were no significant incidents during today's voting. There seem to have been one or two things, but not, 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 not the right one. Right, correct. Sylvester King, deputy superintendent of elections at the electoral office of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, speaking with Nationwide News. The NDP is being led into elections for the first time by lawyer Dr. Godwin Friday. In the last elections in December 2015, the ULP won the NDP by eight seats to seven, the same one seat margin as the previous election in 2010. Meanwhile, the Caribbean community CARICOM is mounting a mission to observe the elections. A member of the Antigua and Barbuda Electoral Commission. Anthony Sons King is heading the six-person mission. In local election news now, People's National Party General Secretary Julian Robinson says the party's declaration of unity was already in the works and is not a response to controversial campaign activities in this year's internal elections. Both candidates uh, in the PNP presidential race, Mark Golding and Lisa Hanna, signed a declaration of unity yesterday. Mr. Robinson notes the party is concerned about unsavory comments, especially on social media during this campaign. As I indicated, it was in the works prior to this, and 
um, you know, the opportunity around now to do it. We, yes, we're, we're concerned about some of the social media posting, some of the occurrences that have been said, and the monitoring committee is staying on top of that. They've called people in, they've issued directives. So, you know, we have two more days, and I hope we can keep the temperatures um, at a level to ensure that we can go into Saturday and after in a spirit of cooperation and unity. He says the document is not one based on sanctions, but it's meant to be a voluntary agreement. Mr. Robinson notes, however, that the Party Election Monitoring Committee and its Code of Conduct remain in place. He's also dismissing claims that he's publicly endorsed either candidate. Let me make it clear. I can't and I have not. I know there's been speculation in the media about the chairman and myself um, supporting one candidate or another. We can't, we have not, and the reality for me, whoever emerges, Unity is that the, one of the major issues that affected the party going into the election, and I think it's important to pull the party together after this and operate as one. Mr. Robinson also sought to explain the substitute voting process. He says that delegates are chosen by groups within the party. So let's say you have a group of 10 at the age under which was a delegate. If for whatever reason the delegate is unavailable, the delegate gets sick, you are allowed an alternative. Each group generally has one or two delegates, and one or two alternates. So if the delegate cannot vote, the alternate can vote. And we throw there's a list of who the delegates are and who the substitutes are, and if a substitute comes before the time, the substitute won't be allowed to vote because you have to give the delegate sufficient time to vote. I mean, you could have a scenario where a substitute shows up at 10 o'clock to vote. That person won't be allowed to vote. Julian Robinson, General Secretary of the People's National Party, PNP, speaking with Nationwide News. He says 3,315 delegates are able to cast their ballots on Saturday, and we are to know by 5 p.m. who the next party president will be. Meanwhile, two prominent politicians in the PNP have come out in support of Mark Golding's candidacy, while a well-known attorney, who's also a former cabinet minister, has announced support for Lisa Hanna with just a day to go before the presidential election is held. Former West Hanover Member of Parliament Ian Hales and the current MP for Northwest St. Catherine, Hugh Graham, say they've decided to support Mr. Golding because he's best placed to unify the party. Mr. Graham expressed his support in a video recorded message. My reason for going with Mark Golding is for unity and that's what the PNP needs at this time. On November 7th, go with Golding. Hugh Graham, Member of Parliament for Northwest St. Catherine. While Mr. Hales is describing Mr. Golding as accomplished and suited to lead the PNP. Mark Golding will unite the People's National Party, that's number one. Mark Golding has the majority to travel across the country to visit each and every constituency in rebuilding the constituencies across the country. Mark Golding has the capacity, he has been a treasurer, Minister of Justice and he has worked within the party and he's a strong member of parliament from a strong constituency. Ian Hales, former West Hanover MP. Meanwhile, former Senator and veteran Queen's Council KD Knight has announced that he's throwing his support behind Ms. Hanna for the presidency of the PNP. Knight says Ms. Hanna is a performer. Comrade delegates, greetings. I'm speaking directly to you. I'm here to enthusiastically support Lisa Hanna to be the next leader of our great party, the People's National Party. I gave it some consideration. I thought about it and I reviewed Lisa's performance as a member of the cabinet. I reviewed her performance as regional chairman, her performance as a member of parliament. Katie Knight, former senator.